pox of this gout, or a gout of this pox, for one of the other plays the rogue with my great toe. But it is no matter. A good wit will use anything, and I will turn diseases to commodity. Now that, those lines were spoken by someone who people say I have a passing resemblance to, <laughs> and that's Sir John Falstaff in the history plays. And what he's actually talking about in that case are his actual bodily infirmities. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna do the same. Um, but he was talking about how he used these, these problems he had, which he'd got from his uh, lifestyle, shall we say, um, and he's gonna claim he got them in the service of the king and therefore give a, be given a great pension, and therefore his diseases would become a commodity. I don't really need this stick, so I think I'll put it down. <laughs> um, so that's one part of uh, my title. The other part were these rather interesting books which appeared over quite a number of years, and you can still find them, which were to do with, could you um, enjoy something, have a hobby, something you really did just for the love of it, but also make some money out of it. So you had these books like, in this case, um, slightly um, esoteric, breeding koi for fun and profit. But it doesn't stop there. It goes actually a little bit more left field with, um, if you fancy trying one of these things, you can read that book to see how you might do them. But the basic idea is you could do something you really loved and were very interested in, but you could also make money out of it. So could you actually do that with plant viruses? Well it does actually have a bit of a long history, although people didn't really know how it worked. On here is supposedly this thing, this tulip, is a thing called the Semper Augustus. And the bulb from which it was grown was the most expensive bulb in human history. And it was sold um, during this phenomenon in Holland called um, tulipomania in the 17th century, where a single bulb of this um, tulip, people would sell a whole estate to get hold of one of those. So it was a kind of madness. It was a great bubble. Um, we, we don't do those kind of things anymore, do we? We've learned our lesson. Um, so it's actually caused, it's not a genetic phenomenon or a transposon phenomenon, it's actually caused by a virus infection, actually by a potivirus. Um, but of course, as these things are actually vegetatively propagated, you can actually, sort of, in a sense, breed from them but it's a very hit and miss affair, and so um, that's why the, the great rarity value. Now you might think, well, that's something which is way in the past, but actually to this day, you've probably seen these plants um, in the foyers of various um, venues. This, this is an abutilon plant, and that beautiful mosaic you get is actually caused by a virus infection from a butylon mosaic virus. That's the nice thing about plant viruses, they do what they say on the tin. Uh, and so you get these beautiful patterns. If you can cure the plant, which you can do, the leaves are just dull and uninteresting, and, and the plants actually have no value. So the virus actually gives them the commodity value in an ornamental. And there are other examples, such as various uh, strains of honeysuckle, which are caused by, the, the beautiful effects are caused by virus infection. But of course, at the time, certainly at this stage in, in Holland, um, nobody knew what was causing it or how it all worked. So, it's a way of using the actual viruses themselves. And you have to remember this is a, the actual modern um, incarnation of virology is fairly recent, the turn of the 20th century. You know, the studies of Ivanovsky in St. Petersburg in 1898 and Martinus Beierink in Delft in Holland in 1904 um, was, were when viruses first became recognized as a class of pathogen in their own right, distinct from things like bacteria or fungi. But there were problems still with that in that you couldn't actually see what you were doing. Um, you couldn't visualize a virus until the invention of the electron microscope, and that had to wait until 1929. Also, you can only cultivate them within uh, their, their organism. Um, you can't plate them out like you could bacteria. But because it turned out through those early studies in the first half of the 20th century, these were very simple entities which you could multiply, and they could be treated almost as chemical entities, and so they made them a very attractive object of study to the early days of molecular biology. 
And so there was a lot of interest in understanding the fundamentals of viruses, not just plant viruses, but phage, of course, and also animal viruses. And I got into this, and at the time, in the mid-70s, I looked something like this. <laughs> and lest you think, uh, see, I'm, I'm very much into my tobacco plants there, and that looks a bit sad and nerdy and, and a bit black and white. Um, it wasn't all like that in the 70s. You could do other things as well. I was young once. <laughs> Um, so, going forward a bit, by the mid-1980s, we had information about various aspects of viruses, a sequence of a large number of their genomes. It was, of course, in the early days when genomic sequencing was in its infancy. It was a several years' work to get the sequence of even a virus. I mean, now it would take you about 10 minutes. In fact, most of that would be waiting for someone else to load samples so they could run them together. Um, but it was, you know, several years' work even to get... Um, uh, a viral genome, but because you could get the complete genome, again, they were studied. At the same time, detailed atomic resolution um, structures were de uh, uh, determined for a number of plant viruses. And plant viruses were particularly important in this kind of work because you could get large amounts of them, and they were also very stable, so you could go through the whole crystallization process, which at those, in those days required a lot of material, I mean, almost gram amounts which is outside the possibility of doing with animal virus. Now, techniques have long evolved since then, so you can use much smaller amounts nowadays. But you still need a fair amount, and it still helps if the virus is stable. At the same time, using the uh, knowledge of the structure of genomes, methods were developed for essentially reverse genetics, ways of manipulating a genome, so you could actually make them into what you want. And so, you could now think about, well, now I can do something to the virus. I know its genome, I know its structure, maybe I want to alter that, and I have a means of doing it. So I first got into this kind of thing, um, of turning them to a commodity after my PhD, when I moved to the John Innes in the 80s, working on cowpea mosaic virus, which is a, was a nicely and well-studied virus because it behaves very well, it grows to high titer in both its natural host, which are cowpeas or black eye beans, um, but also grows in this thing, Nicotiana benthamiana, very um, high yielding, you, get, you can get gram amounts, um, and a nice um, icosahedral virus, unlike the helical virus, TMV, I worked on during my PhD days. So just to look a brief look at the genome of this, it's a bipartite RNA, Unlike, again, TMV, which was monopartite, so I'd obviously, you know, got more ambitious. I was going to work with two RNAs, not just one. And you have an RNA1, which is a, an RNA... This is, sorry, these are, this is a positive strand RNA virus, just like TMV. You have RNA1, which encodes the replicase proteins, so all the proteins involved in, in the replication of the genome, whereas RNA2 is codes for the two structural proteins, the large and the small, as well as this protein which modifies the plasma desmata and enables the virus to move. Now, for some of you working on animal viruses, this looks rather familiar, I imagine. It looks like a bipartite picorna virus, with this being the P1 region and these being the P2 and P3 regions. So it was one of the earliest plant viruses to be, have its RNA sequence determined. And if you were to take a preparation of this virus and spin it down a, a cesium gradient, it would separate into three um, bands, top, middle, and bottom, plant virologists are nothing if not imaginative in their naming. Um, the top components are RNA-free. The middle components contain the smaller RNA, so they're, they're the less dense of the, of the RNA components. And the bottom components contain RNA-1. And not surprisingly, you just need middle and bottom component or the RNAs within them to get an infection. This is, uh, is not necessary. So through a lot of work, um, mainly by Jack Johnson's group, initially at Purdue University and latterly at Scripps. The 3D structure of these particles was determined, and again, to the corner virologists, this will look rather familiar. Um, the, the main difference is that there's no VP4, and uh, the large coat protein is like a, a fused version of VP2 and VP3, and the small coat protein is VP1. Um, so this is the asymmetric unit, one large with two domains, one small with one domain. And they're beta barrels or jelly rolls, if you prefer. Um, and this is a, a space-filling representation. And you can look at, at the actual protein. And actually, if you don't look at the RNA, you can just see a nice, thin-walled 
hollow shell of, of the virus. So how can you try and use this virus and our knowledge of both the genetics and the X-ray structure, plus the availability of a reverse genetic system? Well, the first thing we did, and this was a collaboration between my group and Jack Johnson's, um, was to see if we could actually display antigenic sequences on the surface of the virus particles as potential candidate vaccines. And this gives you an idea of the age. This is in the, in the early 90s. And this is actually a scanned slide. Um, I haven't redone the picture. This is from that era where we had you know, plasmids for RNA2 and the plasmid for RNA1, and you just inserted an antigenic sequence, a small epitope, into a, uh, a location on the surface of the virus particle. And you knew which location to use because the X-ray structure was known. And this is actually a crystallographic structure of Calbium mosaic virus with a 14 amino acid epitope from human rhinovirus 14, which is a, a common cold virus. And you can actually see the nicely displayed um, foreign sequence. It's only a very small sequence. And these things could be useful. Um, so there's this uh, experiment done in 1997 with a whole group of collaborators, a uh, lot of them in Denmark, um, where you expect, we expressed a small 17 amino acid sequence on this, at that same location and used the, those chimeras to inoculate these animals. And those are mink. And if it looks a bit strange, it is actually stuffed. Um, <laughs> they're easier to photograph in that state. Um, and you can actually inject them with this uh, plant virus with the epitope. And I'm not sure how clear this is. Again, it's a scanned slide. You could actually protect them against challenge with mink enteritis virus. This is essentially the same virus as canine parvovirus. So you could actually make a, an experimental plant-based vaccine to protect a target animal against a, a, a veterinary disease. And actually, the nice thing was the um, adjuvant was actually also plant-based. This thing called Quillé from Quijá saponaria. So that all looked quite promising. Um, the problem was, it's quite a cautionary tale, um, that there was no regulatory framework. So if you go to the regulators with, we're going to produce stuff in plants, you know, what do we have to do to prove it's safe? They say, you tell us. And so um, yeah, there's no framework from a new technology. It actually fell by the wayside, that, te that technique. I suppose you could say, if you want to be very generous, you could say we were ahead of our time. That's the way I like to think of it anyway. <laughs> okay, so how could you take this further if, if you just you wanted more than just um, epitopes? Well, and this is a, a pathway quite well trodden by um, people working on other plant viruses, such as TMV or PVX, so, so other genetic systems are available. Um, so we tried this with CPMV because um, its mechanism of gene expression was well understood. We had infectious clones. It makes large quantities of every protein. So if you just add an extra one to the polyprotein, um, you should be able to get loads of that as well. And it also um, infects an edible plant. So you might think of making edible vaccines. And um, the first test was just simply to add an extra um, protein on the end. And we arranged for that to be um, cleaved from the polyprotein by the action of a 2A catalytic peptide from foot and mouth disease virus. So I guess this is a bit of early synthetic biology. I mean, you're taking bits from viruses from different kingdoms for this. And you obviously test expression um, with GFP. So here's our modified RNA2, here's our GFP. In fact, in the presence of RNA1 to provide the replicase machinery, and actually you'll get GFP spreading up the plants. As I say, this is wasn't particularly original. Other people had done it with other viruses. But again, it looked promising. But it quickly ran into a problem that was a limit of about a killer base on the size of the insert you could put into RNA2. Because you were giving it a payload, and GFP or whatever else you put in didn't actually help the virus at all. There was no selection to maintain it. And of course, this is an RNA virus. And it's there, there for very sort of mutagenic, a lot of genetic drift. And basically, you very quickly build up mutations. And actually, what you tend to build up is deletions very quickly. Because, of course, the genomes with the deleted insert replicate more quickly than the ones with the full insert. Plus the fact that these are fully functional viruses, which can um, spread to other plants, which was part of their attraction at the time. If you wanted more, you just take a bit of sap and rub it onto your neighboring plants. But the regulatory authorities don't really see it that way as being an advantage. 
So a solution to our problems came about um, a few years ago. And a number of things came together which had been discovered by other people. First, so what we decided to do was to see if we could make a deleted version of RNA2. And a student back in the early 90s had showed that you could actually gut RNA2, take out most of the structural proteins, just leave the terminal sequences, and that would still be replicated by RNA1. So we thought, okay, we can do that. It'll make a deleted virus. It won't be able to spread as easily. And maybe it can um, main, stably maintain uh, longer sequences. So you try that with GFP, and then you use the technique now of agro-inoculation, whereby you um, insert your sequences into a binary vector and put it into agrobacterium, and then you have to, all you have to do is inoculate the agrobacterium into the leaves. So for those of you not familiar with plant virology and, and plant viruses, this is a, I don't think this technique has any sort of um, parallel in the animal world, just taking some bacteria and squirting it into the whole organism to deliver your gene. But that's, it's a very efficient way of doing it. And if you, originally the idea was this thing should replicate, so we maintain this slightly complex structure at the 5 prime UTR, um, which was known to be necessary for replication. You put this in, in the presence of RNA1, and you've got reasonable levels of GFP expression um, in, in the inoculated part of the leaf. I'm actually quite happy with that to start with. However, Frank Sainsbury um, in the group decided that, well, uh, in the presence of a suppressor of silencing, you didn't really need the replication by RNA1 to get high levels of... Um, of expression because the RNA was so stabilized, the stuff being transcribed from the agrobacterium plasmid was lasted so long, actually putting a replication phase in didn't really give you very much extra. So he thought, well, maybe you can strip out some of this complex nonsense that the five prime duty are so necessary for replication, and let's, let's see um, what we get. Now, I must admit, I suppose years of bitter experience, um, I thought, well, that's bound to ruin it if we try and make it simpler. It normally doesn't work that well. But I was very surprised when removing that first AUG, so just a point mutation, suddenly you go from that level of GFP to that level. And the difference is about 15-fold. So now we're getting very high levels of expression without the need for replication. And all we've got from a virus are these little bits here, a 5 prime UTR and a 3 prime UTR. Now, this is in a transcription cassette, so it's got a 35S promoter and a NOS terminator as well. But um, you can get very, very high levels of expression, and this would be after about a week, six days to seven days. And so you're now getting very high levels without a replicating virus. It's also, this technique is very scalable. So you get this strange looking chap here um, doing something with his leaves and a syringe. Um, that's a pressure infiltration. So you're just forcing bacteria through the stomata into the uh, leaf tissue, and the agrobacteria then do the um, transfer into the nuclei of the cells. But that's quite labor-intensive, actually, if you, especially if you're on a warm day in a greenhouse. You don't really want to spend hours in there. So you can do an, an alternative method is to reverse the process and take a plant, put it in a sort of soup of agrobacterium, reduce the pressure, and then all the air comes out from the intercellular spaces, and of course the cellulose is quite rigid, um, and so when you release the pressure, all the bubbles of air, all the air which you've taken out, gets replaced by the infiltration solution, and so you get the whole plant at once. But you can take that further, and you can do this on an industrial scale, and that is a pilot plant from a company called Medicargo, Incorporated, actually based in Quebec City. And a little bit more about that later. And that's an industrial version of vacuum infiltration. And you can get grams and potentially kilograms if you go really berserk. So I have to give great credit to uh, two students, Frank Sainsbury, who you've already heard about, but also Ava Tuneman, who's in the audience, who weren't content with just making a nice lab tool where we just um, could show we could get very high levels of expression of you know, marker proteins. They actually set to and made this very nice expression system, PEAK, or P, easy and quick, um, the aim, which is a sort of uh, cassette-based system where you can just insert sequences between the two UTRs, the modified um, UTR CPMV, 
5 prime GTR and the 3 prime GTR and lined up on the tDNA as a suppressor of silencing and also a, a selection cassette, which even if you're doing just transient expression, you're not selecting for stable transformance, actually does protect around the left border and, and, and actually enhances expression. And it's a modular design, so you can actually put in multiple copies of these things. Now, there's not a lot of virus left, so I'm not sure you could really call this a viral system anymore, but uh, um, it, I, I, it still has its roots in virology. I also quite like the fact that this is um, the cauliflower mosaic, RIAS 35S promoter. This is cowpea mosaic, RIAS the UTRs. And um, we have a Tombus virus P19 suppressive silencing. So again, a bit of synthetic virology if you want to look at it in those terms. And we, we distribute the kit, so if anyone actually wants to, I'm going to be like a salesman here. Um, we're happy to send out the, the kits of the various vectors. And uh, as a reference. So what do we actually use these for? Are these actually good at making anything you might actually want? Well, because of my background in um, virus structure and virus assembly, one of the first things we looked at was making virus-like particles, again, as potential immunogens. So we've made gone from simple ones like papillomaviruses um, to hepatitis B core particles, and some of you may have been to Ben Duckworth's talk in the AAB section, um, described some of that work, so I won't go through it. Um, hepatitis E, which is work ongoing. Turnit crinkle virus, which is a, a potential use in nanotechnology by a nano, as a nano shell. Nervous necrosis virus, which I imagine most of you won't have heard of, which is a disease of salmon, very important in aquaculture. But what all these share in common is they're all made of a single type of coat protein. So they're just expressing one coat protein and then allowing it to assemble within the cells. You get a bit more complex, and you can go up to this thing, blue tongue virus, which is made of four proteins, and you go even further. And this is actually sort of slightly incestuous. You're now making empty capsids of cowpea mosaic virus, and that actually requires a proteolytic cleavage in order to actually get the assembly to work. So you're producing an enzyme and structural proteins, getting them coordinately expressed. Now, you'll be very pleased to hear, I'm not gonna go through each of these in turn and give you detailed, I'm only gonna give details of what we've done with them, but I'm just gonna limit myself to this one. And this is, I'll give credit in advance to Ava Tuneman for this work. So basically, for those of you who uh, don't work on veterinary viruses, Blue tongue virus is endemic in sub-Saharan Africa, but came to Northern Europe in 2007 and was a, a major potential problem of uh, the, the farming industry in the UK and other Northern European countries. And it's a continuing threat. The beautiful particles are actually made of four, as I said, four main structural proteins. Uh, and they're arranged in three concentric shells. At the heart, you get um, 120 copies of this quite large protein, VP3, and they form subcores. Onto those, you get 780 copies of this smaller protein, and together, they make a thing called a core-like particle, which is stable, and the structure's been sold by the group at Oxford, led by Dave Stewart. And here, the, the subcores in the center, this is just a diagrammatic representation of the double-stranded RNA genome, and here is um, VP7 on the outside. Now, these are nice, stable particles and, and quite pleasant to work with. The problem is they're only poorly immunogenic. To actually get something that could act as a potential vaccine, you actually need the outer proteins. And there are two of these, VP5 and VP2, in different amounts. And there's a cryo-EM structure of these, because these are much less stable. Isn't it always the way the thing you really want it is not the, uh, the easiest to work with? Um, the pH sensitive, but they are highly immunogenic if you can make them. So what you have to do is express four proteins simultaneously in the right stoichiometry to get this in a plant. No problem. Well, you can try several different ways. One of the nice things about using agar infiltration, it's very efficient. So you can just mix four different strains, shake them up, and then infiltrate them together. You might think, well, you know, most, a lot of the cells won't get every construct. And uh, that is a concern if you go down to too low concentrations of agrobacterium, but you can actually make it work reasonably easily. So you can do four separate proteins, or you can line them all up on the same tDNA, do them all at once. And of course, that's, that's putting all your front loading all your work, because it will be, getting short, um, all four will be in every cell, um, but it, it's a, the construction takes longer. 
But the most efficient and flexible proved to be a two-construct approach, which actually has a, um, a good theoretical basis, and that's to put the two inner proteins, three and seven, on one plasmid and the two out on the others. And the reason there's a good theoretical reason for doing this is you can actually take a common core and make different serotypes by decorating the out, putting different outer proteins on the surface. So you don't have to go all, make all four proteins every time to get immunologically reactive material from, um, from each serotype, of which they, well, are currently, I think, are 28, 29, but it's increasing all the time. Now, if you do do this co-expression, you can show that you're getting something, they're assembling. Here's VP3 on its own, the, the material sediments, and you can look in the EM, you get these rather sort of thin-shelled subcores, looking quite as you might expect. You co-express VP3 and VP7, and again, you get co-sedimentation, um, which is what you'd hope if they were assembling, and you get these really nice-looking core-like particles in the, um, you look in the EM. Or you can do all four together, and it looks sort of promising, but the amounts seem a bit variable. And when you look in the EM, you've sort of got a bit of a mess, to be quite honest. Um, so you've got things like core like um, sort of subcores here, core like particles there, possibly a virus like particle up there, but not quite fully assembled. And the problem is, just ramming in as much and making as much protein of each one uh, as you can, you're not getting the stereochemistry right. And the problem is that you get very efficient assembly of the core-like particles. The equilibrium is right in favor here. These are very stable. But if you try and put the outer uh, two proteins on, they tend to fall off very easily and go back to core-like particles. Therefore, to get as much of the really immunologically active material as you, as you can, you really want to overexpress the outer proteins compared to the inner cores. So we're probably going at maximum expression. Not much we can do about making more of the two outer proteins. Maybe you should just make less of the inner ones. And so what Ava did was to take away that mutation which gave you the high translation, knock down the expression of VP3, the innermost one. And so you make less of this one particularly. And if you do that, lo and behold, you actually get far more of the properly assembled virus-like particles. And, of course, what you want to do is see if you can protect these poor animals. This is a sheep looking very sorry for itself with uh, blue tongue disease, and it's transmitted by these blood-sucking culicoides. So if you do produce these nice virus-like particles, this is what they look like, nice and homogenous, have all four proteins in the right amounts. They look like um, natural particles and very similar to um, particles expressed, VLPs expressed in bacular virus and insect cells. And you can actually take these along and, and actually try and protect sheep. And this was done to some colleagues in South Africa. And this is one of these graphs where the lower you, um, the lack of reaction is what you want to see, because this is the clinical reaction index. And um, so here we have our virus-like particles, and the sheep have been challenged, and they have no clinical symptoms of the disease. So now you've made this complex virus-like particle in plants, which can actually protect sheep against the disease. And that's actually being um, worked on um, by uh, a company in South Africa as a way of producing uh, vaccines against blue tongue. And ideally, you want to make the multiple serotypes, of course. And you're not just stuck with uh, structural proteins, although they are my sort of my true love, I should say. Sorry to remember. <laughs> um, you can also make enzymes. Um, so this is human gastric lipase. This is an enzyme you're going to produce in the plants and then uh, purify, and you can show it has all the activity you want after a few days, but the nice thing is you don't always have to purify the enzyme itself. Sometimes you want the product of the activity of the enzyme or the product of a pathway of enzymes, and it's that you really want. You don't care about the protein itself. So you can use bioinformatics to pull out clones, and actually then, and you don't know what they do, you can find out what they do by just very quickly infiltrating them into plants. And here's some work done in collaboration with Anne Osborne's group at the John Innes, and she works on a venison biosynthesis. Now, venison is a triterpene which protects oat against infection with fungi. And you can, this is just one of the enzymes. You look at synthesis by putting this putative enzyme in, and it makes the um, uh, plant leaves glow so this purpley blue color because of the compound that's making this anthranolate compound, which, which the benthamiana plants don't normally make. 
You can look at enzymes of uh, chlorophyll degradation, and if you express, overexpress certain ones, you'll make toxic pro products, and you'll have these horrible effects on the leaves. And it's the other nice thing, if you're just looking for an effect, you don't even have to do a whole leaf. You can just infiltrate individual patches to see what's going on. So you don't have to always to scale up and do a lot. And you can actually identify novel compounds that haven't actually been seen before. And this is um, co-expression of two enzymes for this avenosine and this epoxide, hydroxyl hypoxide compound, which you're able to solve the structure of by looking at various intermediates in the pathway. So this is all very nice and uh, very nicely lab-based stuff. But can you actually make something a real commodity from it? Can you really scale this up to a commercial level? Well, it has been done. And I mentioned this company, Medicargo, um, based in Quebec City. They're now actually part of Mitsubishi Tanabe, a, a Japanese pharmaceutical firm. And they were expressing um, the HA from human influenza virus. And what they found was the HA actually got put into membranous vesicles made up of the plant membranes and you actually get what they would call VL, VLPs. They're sort of, I suppose, almost like li plant liposomes, but studded with uh, HA. They could scale it up. They were able to get regulatory approval for phase two testing. And in 2011, they had successful results. Uh, obviously, you've got pro they'd already dem demonstrated protective immunity in the ferret model of influenza. Um, obviously, do the animal experiments first. And they commenced operations at a, a much bigger facility in North Carolina in 2011. And this is myself and Frank saying we dressed to kill actually in the pilot plant um, where the, the, this automated um, infiltration is done. So to talk about what we've done with plant-based expression or these plant viral expression systems, what I'd say is um, certainly with this hypertranslatable system, we've come a long way in a short time. And to illustrate that, this is Frank Sainsbury's lab notebook. So I don't know if we have PhD students in the audience. I'm guessing we do. There are a couple of lessons to be learned here. One is he actually wrote down what he did, which is always good. Um, so, and the gel was next to it, so he knew what it was. The other great thing was he kept it clean. Um, so instead of you know, expostulating in a moment of things, so I could never reproduce it in, in public. It's rather sweet. It says, simply wow. <laughs> I thought it was rather nice. And then it actually, ha I'm, as you mentioned here, so it's quite nice to actually put what, what you thought when you saw it, rather than just the bare bones. So that was in September 2007. And this is actually, four years later, the production facility that Medicargo built in 2011. And a year later, it had produced 10 million doses of an experimental influenza vaccine for use, uh, for testing. And I believe, I don't know if this has really um, happened uh, yet, that they were planning to do phase three clinical trials um, this winter, but I haven't heard anything about it. So what I want to do now is to uh, acknowledge all the people well, I would like to acknowledge all the people I've worked with over the years, but it takes far too long and you get very bored. So just a, a snapshot. So this is um, Valerie Spall, who made some of the first chimeras back in the early 90s with Mike Shanks, um, who worked with me for many years on the early molecular genetics of the virus. Um, and there I am with sort of dark hair and uh, a fullish beard in a containment greenhouse in around 1990. I don't know if Jack would mind my showing this. Jack Johnson, the crystallographer, who did so much work on the structure of the viruses, without which the, the production of the chimeras um, would not have been possible without all his work there. And Catherine Taylor and Claudine Porter who did, took the chimera work further and also the in, initial stages of um, making the, the gene vectors. And if anyone's wondering, this was taken at the uh, Royal Show at Stoneley, and that's the tent for the, um, it's a breed of cattle, <laughs> called the British Blonde. And just to bring up to date, Ava, you might recognize who's in the audience. You might also see Keith Saunders here as well. And there's Frank Sainsbury, who you've seen dressed in various forms and other ways, and they're more recent 
um, picture and, and various people like Hadrian um, and there's Keith again um, and Julia who are here at the meeting. So those are those acknowledgements and of course I also have to acknowledge the funding which is um, an ever-present need. Um, so obviously the support of the John Innes Centre where I've been for nearly 35 years and the BBSRC and before that the AFRC and before that the ARC and uh, a, a, a Framework 7 pro, uh, project which enabled us to do the blue tongue work. But I'd also very much like to thank the SGM for inviting me to give this um, talk and for uh, giving me the Colworth Award and uh, thank you all very much for being here at the end of the day to hear me speak. Thank you. Thank you.